Ladies and gentlemen, it's a beautiful fish dish today. This is fish and chips. You're going to get a wonderful recipe on a beer batter and a fantastic tartar sauce. This is a recipe you're really going to enjoy. Today I'm going to be making fish and chips. Now I did have one of my uh, viewers that requested this recipe. They said, would you give us a fish and chips recipe? So I decided, yeah, you bet I will. And what I wanted to do here was to give a very authentic British type of recipe. Um, that's really the, the heart of this dish is Great Britain, all right? And that's whether you're in Scotland or Ireland or England, this dish is kind of central in the lifestyle of the British person. It is a very common and common man's dish that is just, well, it's fantastic when it's made the right way. So I'm going to teach you how to get the batter perfect and crispy and crusty and how to prepare your fish. I'm going to show you how to make great chips. The process that you need to use that's an easy one and it trims the process down for making those good quality chips. And folks, we're going to make delicious. So let me show you what I have right here, these fantastic ingredients for fish and chips. Come on. Today we have some wonderful ingredients to make this fantastic dish. So you will know this isn't all about the just the fish. This is about making a wonderful tartar sauce and cooking up the chips just right and the right type of fish. It starts with the fish, folks. I have some cod here. If it looks a little dry, it is. I've been spending some time with paper towels making sure that any excess moisture was removed from this. That is a, an important process. You need to make sure that that's prepared for cooking. If it's too wet, it doesn't do well for this particular dish. So I've got my cod here. We also have some lemons, a shallot. I have some small gherkins here. Also, capers, salt, paprika, mayonnaise, flour, and a beautiful potato. Now folks, the potato you use for this, you can use anything you want. Uh, you can use the Yukon Golds, you can use white potatoes, you can use a russet, that's what I'm going to do today. Whatever you want, you can uh, substitute in any kind of potato for this and it'll work just fine. Back here, we have some beer. Now I'm using a lager, and I'm using a lager because it has a very thick, malty, rich flavor that lends to the batter, and that's part of the flavor of the dish. If you have a thing about alcohol, it's very simple. Just get a non-alcoholic beer. Use that, it'll work fine. Folks, there is a trick when it comes to making a good batter for fish and chips, and the trick is simplicity. Sometimes simplicity is key. You can overdo things. You can put too much in something. All right, we want to get to a basic original British recipe. This is a very old recipe. This goes back a long time and it was made with basic ingredients. Flour, all right. I have here an ale and it is important. It is important that you use an ale for this. Just pour it on in and I'm only going to pour in about half of that. Stir a little bit. Now take a look down in here. There we go. You get a good view. See how it's getting kind of clumpy and stiff? Let's go ahead and get some more beer in there. Don't worry about the foaming. It's going to be a very intense odor. It's good. And understand something. That flavor of the malt does get imparted in the batter after it's cooked. It's just, it's incredible and it is so good. I see there how much beer I have left here. Okay, let's go ahead. Put more of that in there. I'm looking for sort of a thin and runny texture. If it was too thin for pancakes, it would be just right. A little clumping, that'll, that'll go away here in a moment. So you see how that isn't really sticking so very well to my whisk. And this is exactly what I'm looking for. I should have about an inch to inch and a half of liquid left in the bottom of my bottle there. Um, so that's about what I have. 
And if this gets a little thicker, I can add a little more beer to it just to kind of thin it back to this state. But right now, I'm going to set this aside. It just needs to rest. The longer this rests, the better. And that's the reason we do it first. I so look forward to making fish and chips. It is such a delicious dish, but you know, let's face it, fish and so many other uh, meat dishes really do well with a good sauce. And tartar sauce was invented by the French to be used as a meat sauce. And that's exactly what we're using it for here. It's gonna be a fish sauce. I wanna get all of these items cut up and down in that. So first thing I need to do is just prep up my shallot real quick. As soon as I get this skin off of here, we'll get to cutting it up. There we go. Have that all ready to go now. And the thing of it is, is it's kind of three dimensional. So I'm gonna make a cross cut for the sides. Okay. That just keeps me from having like really big dice, which I do not want. The side pieces would be real long. This wedge up here might come out as I make this cut. Oh, what do you know? You notice I leave that root intact? Makes dicing one of these so much easier. There we have it. A nice quarter cup shallot right into the mayo now let's take care of cutting up our little gherkins again we need oh roughly about a quarter cup of little cut gherkins what I'm going to do here I'm just going to cut these down a little bit at least halving them if they're big enough to get three cuts out of it I'll do that So, we'll get that in there. And I would say that was a little more than a quarter of a cup. It looks more like a third of a cup. And I'm all right with that, because frankly, I like those little gherkins. Now on these, these little round capers, these are the big capers, folks. If you have the little ones, you don't need to really do this. You can just toss them right down in there. If you're wondering about what capers are, they're a the berry of a little bush and uh, they have a wonderful flavor to them. It's a robust flavor. It's uh, very salty also, so it adds a lot of salt to this dish. All right, all I need to do is clean up a little bit here. I'll cut my lemon and we're gonna get busy making our tartar. Well, I have everything mixed down in there now. It's time to get these seasonings in there. We'll start with cutting that lemon. I'm gonna need some fresh squeezed lemon in this. It's important. This lemon brings out flavors. And I would say, I have put, oh, easily three to four tablespoons of lemon juice in there. And I got one seed in there, right there, which I'm going to extract right now go. Now I can get on with some salt. It's going to be just a little bit, not much, a small pinch. In other words, no more than a quarter of a uh, teaspoon and then a little bit of the paprika. Again, you don't need a lot, no more than a quarter of a teaspoon to start with. We get all that mixed together. There we go. Now I'm seeing the red streaking stop and a more even displacement of the paprika. I want to taste this and see if those uh, flavors are where I want them. And if they're not, I can adjust them. Now if you're watching this video, this is one of the tutorials. And so this is where I teach you some of the most important tricks that I have. And one of the most important things overall when it comes to making recipes is knowing what you've just created what does that item taste like and there's only one way to know that's to pull a little bit out and taste it find out if you like your tartar sauce or if you need to fix it okay mm. 
Now I like that. I like it a lot. I'm going to bump the salt by about another quarter of a teaspoon. So we have a half a teaspoon in there. I'm going to bump my paprika up by another quarter of a teaspoon. I like paprika, folks, and I think it gives fabulous flavor to items like this. So you will know, I mentioned this is a basic tartar sauce recipe, and it's as basic as it gets for me. You can change this. You can add other flavors to it. You can add herbs like basil and tarragon. They work well in this. You can also uh, add cayenne to it if you want to give it a little bit of zest. Uh, you can um, put cardamom in this. You can add a lot of different items. Go very light with that cardamom, folks. Very, very light with it. But regardless, you end up with delicious. Now, I'm going to get another spoon and taste this because I believe I've got it where I want it. But there's only one way to know. Oh yeah, perfect tartar sauce. I'm going to cover this and keep it refrigerated until it needs to be used, all right? Everyone knows that fish and chips needs lemon wedges. So let's wedge out a lemon, all right? Now, so you'll know there's different ways of doing this, but I'm just going to show you one of. And that's basically sort of the rule of halves where we keep having the half, right? So you can take this, split them open. Let's lay them down flat. And if you want to flick out those seeds, do so. You don't have to contend with them later. This, and then cut them in half and then cut him in half. There we go, we have lemon wedges. Now in other ways I can just work my way across like this. And that gives me nice little lemon wedges also. Different ways of doing it. Either way, you get beautiful wedges and you need that for that fish. Now folks, I thought about different ways of cutting this, and I think what I've chosen because of the length of this is I'm going to half it and then I'm going to make chips off of each half. Uh, normally, if this was shorter, I would just do some cross cuts on there or lengthwise cuts and then make them square that way. Uh, so either way, it'll work fine. Something that helps when you're working on a potato like this is give it a flat surface. So you'll notice there's some narrower sides and some wider sides. Along one of those wider sides, just take off a small amount to make it flat. Boom, it's so much easier to work with now, not rolling around on you, safe. Keep the fingers turned under. There we go. So, we have a good start. All I need to do is cut this down into my chips. So I want good and thick, about, oh, a half inch or better. There we are. This one's going to be a couple of thick ones here. So once I get it to that point, I'm going to remove one and that way I have that flat side to lay them on. Again, it's all about that safety, making it easier. There we go. Cut big, beautiful, thick chips. They're nice. And like I said, about roughly finger size. And I'm going to put this in running water, nice cold water, because we are going to remove some of the starch before we cook these up. And we're going to discuss different cooking methods right now. I have these down in water, and I'm going to change this water out uh, several times until it just comes out clear. Now what this does is it kind of removes some of the excess starch. The technique that I'm going to use is a little different than the one that some Brits like to use on this. Um, but either way, it works. The trick here is we have to, number one, par cook the fries, or the chips in this case, par cook the chips, and then we take them off of the heat, let them stand for a bit or cool down, and then put them through the final cooking process, which is frying. So that's what we're going to do here, uh, but where a lot of folks like to boil these and then dry them and do the, uh, a routine on frying, usually frying twice, 
I cut a little bit of an end run off of that. I do what I would like to say, hey, this is the American method. Um, and it's the same method I teach when it comes to making good golden crisp shoestring french fries. And that is we are going to destarch it. I'm going to then dry these out. I will then par fry them at a temperature lower than they normally fry at. And after about a minute to a minute and a half of par frying, I'll pull them out, put them on a baking sheet, and put them under cold, cold temperature. I'm going to put them in a freezer and bring them down in temperature. Once they're cold, we can then drop them in the hot oil, uh, heated up to the right temperature for cooking, for cooking chips, and we will get beautiful golden chips that are fluffy inside, crispy on the outside, and just the right color. Well, these have been doing really good. They're mostly de-starched now. And the next step, I'm gonna be putting them into one of these salad spinners. They work really good for this. Uh, so I'm gonna put them in a vegetable spinner and give it a, a, a good spin, and that removes the majority of the water. The rest I can easily dry off with a paper towel. Now folks, this may not be the most conventional method of drying chips, but frankly, I think it should be. This wonderful little device takes a lot of work out of stuff like this. There we go. And these are really quite dry already. In this state, they would already do very well if I were to go ahead and just par fry them like this. Um, the reason I remove any excess moisture, guys, I'm wanting this to have more of a frying effect to the outside of the fry. I don't want any kind of a vapor barrier forming between the French fry and the oil. I want the oil to hit that French fry and to start immediately cooking the interior of the French fry. Um, and this is where we have to pay attention to a little thing that we call uh, Leyden, or a, a lesson that we learned from Professor Leyden Frost, all right? Okay, this scientist uh, named Leyden Frost, he noticed that when water came in contact with a sufficiently hot enough surface, it would form a bubble and it would simply dance around on top of that surface. It wouldn't immediately evaporate. And what he noticed that was happening there was it was forming a vapor barrier. And that vapor was preventing the heat from really coming in contact with that uh, water droplet. And we want to avoid that particular scenario on cooking these chips. All right, so I want to make sure they're dry, and that way when they hit the oil, we don't get that happening. We get a good solid cooking action. And with that solid cooking action, we then get a different texture and effect from our fry. The whole idea here, guys, is to partially cook this fry and then to bring it down in temperature. And by bringing it down in temperature, we've made the cooking process longer. So the idea there is to cook the outer part of the fry longer and the inside of the fry a long enough period of time to make it fluffy and light. And uh, so that's what we're doing here. And I keep saying fry, we're making chips here. Uh, I keep forgetting this is a British recipe. I need to use British nomenclature for it if I wanna be fair. So on our chips, we're drying them off real good here and I'm about to par fry them. We're gonna cook the oil at uh, 295 degrees. I can't stress this enough. When you're gonna be cooking in the kitchen, do yourself a favor, spend the few dollars it costs to get a th set of thermometers, not just one, you need several. Uh, but one we're gonna to use today is a fry thermometer. You can get this in both a, a steel form with a dial or like this, and this works for candy or frying, and it's a great thermometer for this. So. It, do yourself that favor because you, there's no way of knowing if your oil is 295 degrees or 350 degrees without this. And so when you're relying on specific temperatures, you need that sucker. Go ahead and get it. I have this oil heating. Uh, of course, you can see that on the bottom of the pan. It's forming the unique shapes that it does when oil heats. And I have a pan back over on the side right over there. That's going to be to throw these chips onto after the fry. Now folks, 
please remember this is a very very short fry all I want to do is throw these into the oil at 295 degrees and leave them there uh, for one and one half minutes so basically 90 seconds is what I'm going to be cooking these for all right just that simple now um, need a slotted spoon and it doesn't hurt to have some tongs handy so do that you don't need anything to catch grease back here on that uh, pan the uh, grease needs to be on that because there's the thing you're going to put that thing in the freezer and all of that oil is just going to cause the uh, excuse me these chips to slide right off of that pan when it comes time to cook them they can be frozen solid and they'll still slide right off of there so do yourself that favor nothing to drain with okay it's not needed the oil temperature has just now come up to 295 degrees something i want to mention when you go throwing these down in there don't use your hands folks you're going to get burned all right use a slotted spoon or something like that to get them in there safely all right much better to do something safe like this than to get splashed back all right now this is 90 seconds I like to give these a good stir as they're cooking because I don't want them sticking together or pulling together in a group and that way you know it kind of hinders the, the cooking process. It has now been 90 seconds, a minute and a half. There we go. We have a good start on the cook. My potatoes are finished par frying, and now I just need to get this into my freezer. When these are cold to the touch, they're ready to cook. Now here's the neat thing. These can be done this way days or even weeks in advance, placed in the freezer in a bag and left that way uh, until you're ready to use them. And it's the same type of chips that you would see used in restaurants when they pull them out of frozen bags that way. I've taken my chips out of the freezer and they are cold. They are frozen actually. And that's just perfect really because it's going to give me the best quality chip. Um, the colder that core is, the longer the outside cooks, the crispier it gets. Uh, and the, the whole chip just really gets so much better this way. Uh, so I really recommend this method. Please give it a try if you've never done it. Right now the oil is coming back up in temperature. Uh, it's just getting close to 250 now and when it hits 325 to 350 in that bracket then I'll go ahead and throw these chips down in there. I'm going to cook half of them and then I'll cook the other half following that. There we go. Okay, now that we have these started up, I think I'm going to do a count up timer. And so I'll do that and it'll sit here and count up for us. And we'll know just exactly how long that cook ends up being. All right? It makes life so much easier when you have that. Now folks, it's important even in your own kitchen, use a count up timer. When you're cooking or if you're learning to cook, this helps you to get so much better you end up being a much more proficient cook that timer gives you a good idea of how things relate to each other my chips have been cooking now for six minutes and 34 35 seconds actually about seven minutes total when you figure the time i put them in They've come out a beautiful color. Look at this. This is just about right. Just about the color I'm looking for. And it's going to be wonderful. These are already firm. They floated to the surface a few minutes ago. And when they do that, that tells you that the center of them, the inside, is cooked now. It's cooked through. And you can remove them at that point. So anywhere from there to as dark as you would like to get them. Now I like more color on my chips just the way I am I like them well done basically so mine are going to be in there for oh about eight minutes or maybe just a little bit more 
my chips are out of the oil and I'm gonna go ahead and season them. Now I have some salt mixed with MSG and this is a, a mixture that I do myself. And I do this on purpose because I love it on uh, potatoes that are fried. That's what I'm gonna do right there. And I'm gonna give a very, very light dusting with paprika over the top of these. There we go. Just so lightly. And those are ready to enjoy. Now the others are frying up. I know how long they're going to take because I used my timer from before and we're up and cooking. As soon as those are done, we put our fish in there and it won't be long before we're having a good dinner. Okay, we are at that point where it's time to start thinking about the fish. I've just re-stirred my batter. It's looking beautiful. And I have here a bowl of flour, it's just a small amount. I'm gonna take my fish after salting it, drop it in the flour, and we're gonna get busy working it out. So I'm gonna start with a little salt over the top here. Give them a turn. A little salt on the other side. It doesn't take a whole lot, but get some on there. Of course, if you're not a little messy with the salt, I think you don't you didn't use enough. Now we need to go ahead and get these floured. Put the other one in here and I'm just shaking them together. Now they can stay right down here in the flour until you're ready to batter them and get them in the oil. That's just perfectly fine. Oh yeah, get a little salt on there. And that's some ultra fine salt that I grind down and a little paprika. Oh yes, there we go. Now it's time for us to get our fish down in there. I want to take a fillet of cod. I'm going to knock off the extra flour. There we go. Drop it down into my batter. Get it thoroughly coated. Oh yes. I'm going to pull it up and let some of that batter run off and then lay it into the oil away from me. There we go. There we are. Do the other one the same way. folks it is cooking up beautiful as soon as it starts getting a little bit golden on one side and that's about one minute in then I want to take these and turn them over I'll cook them on the second side for four minutes turn them over one more time cook them on the last side for three minutes and then that gives me about a total of eight minutes cooking overall four on each side now these little bits around it little crunchies if you wish to include those makes a wonderful little extra with the fish I enjoy those you want to keep your oil in about the 325 to 350 degree range a little warmer if you want it darker a little cooler that 325 if you want it to be a lighter color a little more golden my timer has just sounded it's been four minutes Oh, that's beautiful. Look at that. Nice and crispy. Isn't that a gorgeous looking sight? Frying fish. Now, that is something that Texans can get behind on any day of the week. The quantities of ingredients that we've used today, guys, as you saw, I would just add some pickles and uh, capers in small quantities to kind of build that up. What I ended up with here though was I started with about a quarter of a cup of pickles. Here I have a couple of tablespoon of capers and I used a medium shallot was what I started with on that. Also a pinch of salt and up to about a half a teaspoon of paprika worked into that. Also you can sprinkle a little over the top as a garnish it looks really nice. 
The potato you use, hey, pick a potato, folks. I got these russets. That's what I have around here, so that's what I'm using today. You can use a Yukon Gold, or you can use white potatoes for this, or reds. Anything you'd like, just get at it with a potato and enjoy that thing. The amount of mayonnaise that I used for this, that was about a cup and a half to two cups of mayonnaise to make that wonderful tartar sauce. Now these fillets that I had, these are good thick cod fillets. Now folks, and that's important, you need codfish for this. The um, cod is going to be a nice thick fish and it also has a, a very certain particular flavor to it that, that you're not going to get elsewhere. And you'll notice it when you've tasted it, you'll be like, okay, yeah, that's right. That's the perfect fish for this dish. And it is the most commonly used in Britain. Also, flour and beer. I used a cup of flour there and one bottle of beer. Uh, as far as the lemon, I used juice of about a half a lemon. And of course, you want plenty of wedges for the fish itself. All right. Timer has just gone off. Place these on an appropriate drain rack. And of course, if you like the little crispies, you might want to grab a slotted spoon. And you can fish those little golden goodies out of there. You can make as much of this as you want by simply drizzling the batter down in the hot oil. Now that we have that out of the oil, don't forget a little bit of salt. Oh yeah. Yes. Wonderful. All right, I have gone ahead and put some of the tartar sauce in a bowl. Let's get some lemon wedges up here. We want some nice, clean, pretty plating. Something that shows off our ingredients well. And speaks of the dish. Mm, yeah. <laughs> I've been enjoying this. Mm. The fish is so flaky. Mm. The tartar sauce, it's the bomb. Oh yeah. And these chips. Folks, if you want a good chip. Oh yeah. That's some really, really good stuff. It's so earthy, down to earth, simple, everyday food. And that's what it should be, it's good. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. I appreciate you watching this. If you would, please also take a look at the work I do on Patreon. I've just started that. That is a new funding source uh, that is provided for people in the arts and people who teach. Um, and uh, that's what I'm doing here is I'm teaching an artistic endeavor. And also I'm about to start the photography side of things. So I'll be doing that also. If you would check that out, you can help me out if you're interested. Also, if you would, please take a look at the channel and subscribe. If you enjoyed this video, click that like button. And the comment section is there for a reason, guys. If you have a request, if you have a question, if you would like to try something new, run it past me. I'm glad to answer questions there. Thank you very much for watching, and please enjoy your day. Bye-bye. Oh, yeah.